Shaw E. President's Day Weekend E. Worship. Our opening hymn is a reference to the scriptures that uh, Reverend Beatrix will be preaching from as we round out our worship series of the waters of baptism. Please join us in our opening hymn, number 817, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight. <laughs> family is going to uh, bring in the light for us. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened. Many also feel heaven near. When Jesus was baptized, God called him beloved. May we also feel God's love. In the waters of baptism, we catch a glimpse of a love that is vibrant and divine. Along a love that transforms our common days with a beauty, not of our making, but from you, the light of the world. Amen. And next, Mr. Corey will lead our Flourish language. That was beautiful, Matthew. Thank you, Beatrix. Flourish. Alone, together, we practice wholehearted life alone and together. Evergreen is an open and affirming faith community rooted in the way of Jesus. We grow through spiritual practices that nourish the individual and cultivate a more compassionate world. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning on this snowy Valentine's Day, like Mr. Jim said. See, we got, I seen Celia, I seen Betty, and a friend who you, who's a friend that you have, Betty? Who's that? Then Matthew, here we go, here we go. Baby Rosalind in the house somewhere? Let's see. Cool. So, Check out this entire month. We will be celebrating Black History Month, right? Uh, so last week we talked about people that were musicians, right? That's baby Roslyn. We talked about musicians. So this week we're going to talk about sports, okay? I'm going to get a power slide. Uh, okay. So Black History Snap Facts, sports edition. Okay. Last week, I asked Miss Betty, what is Black History Month? All right. So in the month of February, which is set aside to honor Black history, we shine a long overdue spotlight on the people who um, taught 
the history or the the untaught history of people who deserve to be celebrated for their work um, of the civil rights, sports, music, and more. But we can't remember to um, show their impact outside of Black History Month because their work lasted outside of Black History Month and they paved the way for many of us today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and see who we're going to highlight this week. Number one, we have Mr. Jackie Robinson. I'm not sure if any of you guys know who this is, but this young man, um, he was the first African-American baseball player in history. Um, he actually had 12 home runs his rookie year. His rookie year, what that means is that was his first year playing baseball. And can you believe he actually made 12 home runs that year? So they named him Rookie of the Year. And then he was later named the first African-American to be added to the Hall of Fame. Then next, we have Miss Wilma Rudolph. She was the fastest woman of her time. The fastest. You can tell by the look of this picture that she was very fast. She's not struggling at all. And she actually had polio. Polio is a disease that actually keeps you from walking. So it forced her to wear a brace on her leg, but that didn't stop her. She eventually came the first woman to win three gold medals in 1960 in the same Olympics. She didn't do it in 1961 and 62 and 63. She did it in the same year. And so the next year she was actually named the female of the year. And so to give you context, they tried to throw her a parade for being such this amazing woman. And when they tried to throw her the parade, they only wanted black people there. But she said, no, I'm not going to do this parade if I don't have black and white people there. And then they eventually named her the female of the year that year. And this beautiful face right here. I think we all may know who this face is. It's Miss Simone Biles. She was the first black woman to win an artistic gymnastics world championship all around title. And she's done it five times. And she's only 23 years old. She's younger than me. Simone is the first woman gymnast to win three back to back to back all around world titles. And can you believe she's only 4'8", she's only 23 like I said, and she likes reading, shopping, and spending time with her family just like us. Now, I have a video for you guys to watch her. I'm not sure if the video is, is clear or not. We're going to watch just a minute of it. And I'll put the link in the, in the chat so you guys can watch it later. But this is our Black History moment for this week, guys. And here's your video. It is unreal. It is unreal and as well done as anybody, man or woman, very first tumbling has completed. Lifting, double back, off the back, very first tumbling pass. Lifting, double back. Just keep making history, Simone Biles. Simone's got enough gold medals at all. Someone give this girl a crown. 
And that was our Black History moment for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I can't wait to see you guys next week. I love you guys so much. Happy Valentine's Day. And can we welcome our visitors or say hey to our visitors? One, two, Three. Hi. Hey. That's it. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have a good week. Here at Evergreen, we honor and practice alone and together the work of silence. You may not feel it right now, but you are in the middle of a change of seasons. Today, it's Valentine's, it's Mardi Gras weekend, it's a snow day. These are all things that we get excited about and love. But this time next week, we'll be entering into the journey of Lent, a slower, more reflective time. We just finished an historic impeachment trial, and moving on to the next stage of American governance. And all these transitions can be exhausting and bewildering and uprooting. So we honor the work of silence to bring us back into our rooted selves. There's no right or wrong way to do this. As we enter one season after leaving another, I simply invite you to place both feet firmly on the floor, to hook into your breath, to release your shoulders, release the tension in your jaw, let the tongue release from the mouth, a roof of your mouth. Take a breath in and breathe out. As we enter into this work of silence, take a look at your window. For us Southerners, snow has this uncanny ability to lock everything in time and space. I'll play a tone to begin our work and in about a minute, I'll play another tone to bring us out. Amen. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, we ask for a blessing upon this reading of scripture such that you and your word would be illuminated for us in new ways, ways that we could never have even dreamed. Amen. Our text this morning comes from the ninth chapter of the book of Mark, verses 2 through 8, and then 14 through 17, 27, excuse me. Hear now the word of God. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking to Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. 
Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw them, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone in the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. Jesus answered them, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him immediately, it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, your, your, you spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, may the words of this mouth and the meditation of all these hearts be holy, pleasing, and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love sharing this fact about myself, but it's, it's also kind of a secret. I love magic. I love the idea of magic. I love reading books in the fantasy genre. The first book that really got me reading as a kid was Harry Potter, and I have not stopped desperately seeking that magical experience. Every time I go for a hike, I'm secretly hoping I'll stumble upon a magical lamp post and there's a tree around the block for me that I just love because it has a miniature fairy village, like the kind you can buy at a garden store. And I'm convinced I saw a leprechaun in Ireland. I'm just, you know, I'm just waiting for my letter from Hogwarts to show up, just a bit delayed in the mail. I love magic. And the first four verses in today's passage read like a fantasy novel. Each sentence is more otherworldly than the last. First, the main character goes up to a mountain top alone with a few friends. In the Bible, if you're heading to a mountain, you're about to meet with the divine, buckle up. So you can recall Moses and the Ten Commandments and Elijah witnessing the presence of God pass by at Mount Horeb. So then Jesus is transfigured, whatever that means, and his clothing becomes stark, beautiful, dazzling, the stuff of fairy tales. And then Elijah and Moses show up. These are the major figures of the tradition, the stuff of legends, and here they are conferencing with Jesus. The mountaintop experience is so divine and holy and otherworldly. God's presence is obvious. The magic is right there. And we also have reason to connect mountaintop experiences to the fight for justice. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. references Moses' mountaintop experience in his I've been to the mountaintop speech at Mason Temple 10 minutes from here in Memphis, Tennessee, which he delivered on the day before he was assassinated. I bet being there and hearing that speech and marching with MLK felt a bit otherworldly, scary and risky and, and tense and emotions running high and otherworldly, a bit of the divine with you. I definitely 
got that otherworldly rush the last time I was gathered with justice seekers and mass, which was at the MICA public meeting in September of 2019, a lifetime ago. And I wonder if when you are doing that work of justice, do you feel that rush? The certainty of God's presence, a touch of magic, the feeling that something bigger than me is going on here. I do, and that's something I'm seeking when I do that work, either because of my love for magic or my love for God or my love for my neighbor. And bless his heart, Peter, as I like to call him, he says exactly what I would have said if I was in this moment on the mountaintop with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Can we stay here a little longer? It is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. When I'm in the middle of a fantasy book that's like a really good book, I can press a button on my Kindle and it'll tell me how many more chapters I have left, how long I can stay here. I just do not want it to end. I just want to delay coming down from the mountain. And I think I have felt that reluctance on the drive home from a protest or even going back to work on a Monday after something obscene happened in the world over the weekend. It, it feels like going back to reality or back to the ordinary when I knew I encountered God when I was doing the holy work of seeking justice. It just feels so lackluster, so plain next to what was dazzling me before. The question of that reluctance is a question of faith. I believe Jesus is on that mountaintop. I felt him, I experienced him. Maybe even I saw him in the eyes of my neighbor or heard his voice cry out. Do we really believe that Jesus comes with us down from that mountain and also into the ordinary mundane events of the day to day? Do you? Peter's stuck on the mountaintop, but life is happening on the ground. The crew gets down to sea level, minus Moses and Elijah, and there's a parent who has watched his child suffer for years, a parent who has done everything, a parent who is tired but determined not to give up. Evergreen has a strong tradition of seeing God in the cosmic justice balance to believe in these cosmic justice issues, but do you believe that God cares about this parent and his child? Do you believe that God is with you even when you are in between jobs or with your friend when they are sick or that God mourns with you when you receive bad news? Do you believe that God is present with you during the tiny tragedies of life? Not just in the cosmic bend toward justice, but in the mundane routine ups and downs of the day? Believe it or not, it is true. God is, God is even there. God's promise in baptism is that God will be present with us always. The parent in the story has a prayer for that. I believe, help my unbelief. That's a faith statement and a prayer because he's turning to the source. He's turning to God, even in his unbelief, uh, which brings me great relief that I can turn to God even when I am not sure I believe. And I... This prayer that he's saying is, I believe that you are in the big stuff. Help me in my unbelief that you are in the small stuff too. In some ways, it's easier to believe in God as a king who cares about what's going on in the kingdom. And it's harder to believe in God as a father or as a parent, someone who cares about what's going on in the life of you, their child. We've mentioned earlier in this season, uh, the series called The Waters of Baptism, the baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. That inward grace is God's presence with us, that God will never leave us nor forsake us, but that God is with us always until the end of time. That's the inward grace and promise that is already true, whether we believe it or not, whether we get baptized or not. And the outward sign of baptism physically and visibly marks us and seals us with that promise. The affirmation of baptism is that God is present with us always throughout the ups and downs, even the ups and downs of belief, a person's membership in the family of God and belovedness by God as a child of God is never in question. God is even in the ordinary, the daily grind. God cares enough to be up in your space and up in your business 
just like God, Jesus, one minute was up on the mountaintop dazzling. And the next minute he's taking a personal interest in this parent and his child. Not just on the mountaintop or in the march toward justice, those kinds of things that we do as a church at Evergreen um, that are that are heavy and important and big scale, big picture, you know, 50,000 feet up, but also in the day to day, the tiny victories and tragedies that make up life. We do not have the promise that God will heal every ailment that affects us or the people we love. We do not have the promise that if we pray hard enough or if we say the right thing, do the right thing, nothing bad will happen to us. In fact, we have the opposite of that. We have the promise of real life. We have the examples we find in the Bible are of people who are, they're in danger all the time, peril, people who are persecuted and suffered. And God does not take away that suffering or that risk that things will not go as we want them to go. But God does promise to be with us, to be present to us and present to our suffering. We believe in a God who suffered with us. We were baptized into Jesus's death and suffering, and he is also present with us during those times of suffering. You might have to look for God. You know, it might not be obvious where God is in those moments. You might have to attend to God to sense God's presence, but God is there. Baptism is a marker in our tradition that says it's going to be okay because whatever happens, God is with us. And maybe that's where the everyday magic lies. We say we believe it, but do we? When our trials are small or our, our trials are mundane, you know, how often do we say, well, it's not as bad as what's going on with so-and-so, or, well, it could be a lot worse, or, well, at least it's not this other thing. God's not saying that. that that's us. That's not, that's not God. All things considered. Do you still believe that you are in God's family, that these things matter to God? God's not doing that whataboutism. I mean, the, what it comes down to is, do you believe that you matter to God? And baptism says yes. Baptism tells us that your problems are God's problems. Your personal suffering is also felt by God. And God rejoices with those who rejoice and mourns with those who mourn. Because Jesus did not set up a dwelling place. Jesus, you know, did not do what Peter asked of him. And, you know, Jesus was on earth so as to not do that, basically. Jesus came down from the mountaintop and wants to be up in your face and space and up in your business in the every day and day. And baptism is our promise that whether we believe it or not, whether we want it or not, Jesus wants to be in our everyday business mundane as it is. Here at Evergreen, we talk a lot about how God is up on that mountaintop and the cosmic bend toward justice. We know that God is on the side of the poor. We hear about that often. But God is not just there. God is with you always until the end of time. And the magic that I love so much and that I seek out when I'm reading these fantasy genre books that magic of the divine is in the day-to-day, -day, whether it dazzles or not. That is the promise of baptism. And we even have a prayer to give us senses to perceive the wonder of God's presence with us every single day. I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen. Next, we're entering into a time of Reflection and offering. Jim is going to provide some music for reflection. And um, again, I invite any visitors or anyone who wants to learn more about Evergreen to um, fill out our virtual connect card, which I'll put in the chat again. And this is just a time to reflect on what you've heard today. Um, that phrase, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, and ponder this alone and together with us. Jim?
Amen. And uh, Jim is going to lead us in our closing song. Lord, the light of your love is shining. And our closing hymn is dedicated to all my 90s millennial friends who grew up singing this song in high school youth groups and college collegiate ministries. <laughs> go. Go in peace. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>